Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. John Eichard, Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Economics from the University of Missouri, Columbia. He will be speaking with us today on local foods, past, present, and future. John was raised on a small dairy farm in Southwest Missouri and received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in agricultural economics from the University of Missouri. He worked in the private industry for a time and spent 30 years in various professorial positions at North Carolina State University, Oklahoma State University, the University of Georgia, and the University of Missouri. In the 80s, John had a conversion of sorts after seeing the failures of the policies he had been advocating to farmers. He then reoriented his work towards agricultural and economic sustainability as a means of supporting small family farms and rural communities. Since retiring, John spends most of his time writing and speaking on issues related to sustainability with an emphasis on economics and agriculture. He is the author of six books. In 2014, Eichard was commissioned by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations to write the regional report, Family Farms of North America, in recognition for the International Year of Family Farming. He currently resides with his wife, Ellen, in Fairfield, Iowa. John, welcome. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and to, uh, you know, share my perspectives on, on, uh, on the past, present, and future of, uh, of, of the local food movement. So what I want to do is I want to go through very quickly um, a set of slides or a set of a PowerPoint presentation that I prepared so I can cover a lot of territory in a short period of time. And then I want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion or comments afterwards because I realize my perspective isn't the only perspective on these issues and I want to hear from other people. So I assume that you want me to uh, people to leave their questions in the chat box when they get them. And then uh, when we come back, Caitlin will pick, go through the and ask the questions so that we can get through whatever you want to talk about. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started on the presentation. And then we can come back and, and have some discussion later on. Okay, let me, all right. Local foods, past, present, and future. I start out by saying, you know, that everything functions in cycles. And so the, the trends of the past don't necessarily continue on into the future. So a lot of people, whenever they're projecting the future, a lot of futurists, what they'll do is they'll simply look at trends of the past 15, 20 years, and they'll project out into the future and say, well, that's the direction we're headed, so that's kind of where we're going to end up. But trends never continue in, indefinitely. I came across an article back in the 1990s that was called 20 Great Ideas of Science, and it was in Science Magazine or the Science Journal, which is one of the most respected international journals in the world. And it's where some uh, teachers in college or high school were suggesting that there were 20 great ideas of science that were so basic that everyone should know these, even kids in high school should learn these. And on the list that they had presented were laws like the laws of gravity and motion and thermodynamics. But the, on the list that I hadn't seen before was one that said everything on earth functions in cycles. There were some later comments on that, and they come back and said, well, to be more accurate, everything on Earth tends to function in cycles because the cycles aren't precise necessarily like sine functions or like something going around in, in a circle, but, but that everything tends to function in cycles. And if you think about it, you, you know, when you look at the, the stars and the moon and the sun and all of that, where they were studying science early on, everything rotates and turns around. If you think about it, we have cycle, cyclical cycles in the seasons of the years. Uh, we even have fashion cycles and we have economic cycles that we tend to go through over time. So it's one of those natural tendencies that everything functions in cycles. 
And I think that's where the concept come from, you know, this old saying, uh, common sense that everything goes up eventually comes around, everything that goes around eventually comes back around. That's just a kind of a common way of saying that everything functions in cycles. And so if that's so, then no trend will continue forever. Eventually, every trend will reverse and move in a different direction. The question is, is why, when, and how it will change and what the consequences will be. I say that the organic and local food movement that we've seen going on for the past several years it is not just a minor blip, as some people would call it, and it's not just a minor thing to be considered, but it's a tendency of something that's eventually going to happen in the future and take us to a fundamentally different direction. If you go back to the farm si or food system of the 40s and 1950s, back when I was growing up down in South Missouri, we, we had a local food system at that time. We had small diversified farms. I grew up on a small diversified family farm down in Southwest Missouri. And at the time I was growing up in the forties in particular, we depended a lot on physical labor of the people that lived on the farm and, and horses. And then later on in the late fifties, we began to get farm tractors on the farms in the area where I lived. But it was very different back then. Back then, by necessity, the people that farmed, including on my farm or my dad's farm, uh, we had to depend upon each other. We shared the work. I can remember when I was a kid that we would have threshing crews and silo filling crews that would be up to 30 to 40 people that would go from farm to farm around the community and help each farmer uh, fill the silos. But it wasn't only that that we worked together. We shared social activities. Back then, nobody worked on Sunday and we'd actually go visit each other on Sunday afternoon. We didn't have telephones, so somebody would just pop in on Sunday afternoon and visit their neighbors or visit someone else. All the kids went to school together. They went to churches together, had a number of different churches, but we went to churches together. And it's what I call we had communities of necessity. Back then, we didn't have supermarkets. We had local independent grocery stores, as we call it. There was no self-service. I can remember when Piggly Wiggly was the first self-service market that came into Marshfield, Missouri, which was about 15, 20 miles from our hometown. There were no super centers like the big Walmart and Kroger and other things of that nature. We had independent restaurants and it would be truck stops on Highway 66 that run through our little town of Conway. But there were no fast food franchises. I saw the first fast food franchise I saw when I went to college. It was the McDonald's. We had local processing plants, meat packing plants, fruit and vegetable canneries, local flour mills. I would guess that virtually everything that we ate, or 70 to 80 percent, I'd say, of everything that we ate came within 50 miles of our home was the origin of it. But over a period of about 50 years, between the 1940s and 1990s in particular, we saw a fundamental change in the food system. The food system changed, and it changed dramatically. The farm and food systems that we've got today are what are called industrial and global. They're large scale, specialized, routinized, corporately controlled operations that function all the way through the system, even though the farms may be independently owned. In many cases, it's the processing corporations that actually control most of the important decisions on that farm. It's not a local food system today. The studies vary, but anywhere from 12 to 1700 to 2000 miles. We know that our food travels from the point of production to the point of consumption. That's geographic specialization of production and of consumption as people concentrate in urban areas as well. But I think the trend of industrialization in the food system has run its course. And we're due for a fundamental change. And I believe that the farms and food systems of the future will be far more like those of the past than they are those of the today. And that the trend we see today will change. I mean, it's already showing signs of reversing. I believe when we look to the future that we're going to see a food system and farms that are much more diverse than they are now, that are be individualistic and, and site-specific as opposed to standardized. And they will be interdependent where people will be making, dependent, be making individual decisions as to the extent that they want to cooperate and the extent that they want to be on their own rather than corporate controlled and that the food systems will be local. They'll be community-based, bioregionally based and that the organic and local food systems that we see and the trends we've seen there over the past 30 years 
signal a trend back to a future that's very much uh, very different than what we see today. So if we look at those trends that the modern organic food movement then just kind of followed the development of that really began in the 1960s that, you know, that organic foods began earlier than that going all the way back. But when we talk about the modern organic food market, it really began in the 1960s with the back to the land people. And the back to the land people, that whole movement was basically a rejection of the industrialization of agriculture and the food system. And people went out and created their own communities and they grew their own food. And they were the people that started the first health food stores. And many of the early food cooperatives emerged out of that. We come up to the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, the organic movement was the one that was driving uh, the, the system. It had come out from the back to the land people and began to move into the mainstream during the 2000s, the early 90s to the early 2000s. It was growing at a rate of about 20% per year, meaning it was doubling every three or four years. After the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, it still continued to grow at a rate of about 10% per year. But with moving into the mainframe food system, it was growing, but it was also changing in character. Organic production was becoming more specialized, more standardized on larger and larger farming operations, organic farming operations that began to look more like industrial agriculture than the small diversified farms where it had begun. And with the industrialization of organic, we was facilitated by the organic standards, which was went into effect in the, I think the early, the late 1990s, in that period of time, the industrialization of organic, uh, then we began to see uh, the emergence of the local food system in, in response to that. And that was because the people that had joined into the organic movement because of the concern about the ecological and social integrity of the movement. It wasn't just about pesticides. It wasn't just about concern of the pesticides or the chemical fertilizers or so on in the use of the food production, although that was an important concern. It, it was about the integrity, the ecological, social, and economic integrity of the overall food system. And so we saw the emergence then of the local food movement that's continued to grow during this period of time. And it kind of showed signs of sort of leveling out as local began to be more and more associated with with the, the grocery stores that uh, or the supermarkets that saw local as a way to, you know, to try to uh, kind of connect themselves to the community in which they function. But the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic of 2020, we saw a major upsurge in local food sales, as you've heard on the programs this morning, if you've been on the program. We saw the resurgence in people that wanted to go on to the farmers markets and the farmers markets that couldn't function in person anymore. Then they went toward online sales and farmers that had CSAs went to online sales and many individual farmers that were already online saw their sales grow so fast that they could barely keep up with it. And they're still in a situation where the, the processing plants, particularly for locally grown animal products are lined up and scheduled a year or two years in advance, trying to meet the growing demand. We've also seen an upsurge in electronic aggregation where people will go online and a number of farmers kind of like food hubs, but they operate online where they put their products available online. Customers can go on and process online. And so these are important kind of trends that emerged during the COVID crisis. The COVID issue reveals some major risk in the overall food system that we have today that I think will be critical as we look to the future and the direction that the food system is going to go. This industrial food system that we've created with large scale production, processing, distribution uh, is very efficient economically anyway, but it's lacking in resilience. It, it's lacking in the ability with, to withstand shocks, rebound and to adjust to a changing environment. And we saw the consequences of that in 2020, when we saw the disruption of the food system with respect to the large processing plants, when they had outbreaks of the, of the COVID virus in those plants, it wasn't just a matter of slowing down the process. They were forced to shut them down for a period of time. And, th and that disrupted the whole food system. And the problem is, is even though this was running like a factory assembly line all the way from uh, genetic selection all the way through the production, processing, distribution. That's the way that this industrial food system functions. You, you can't shut off 
a food system the same way you can shut down a factory. When the processing went down, the animals continued to grow. The crops continued to grow. There was no place for them to go, even though when you got to the retail level, when you got to the supermarkets, the supermarkets was empty because nothing could get through the system. So it revealed this, this, this failure or fundamental flaw within the system is the lack of resilience. And, and it's not just in processing and distribution. It's there on the farms. The large specialized farming operations are also lacking in resilience. They're inherently risky. Farmers and farmers know this face production risk on the crops. It's a threat of droughts or flood or disease or disease. I mean, insects or disease. We saw a lot of those in 2020, particularly with droughts and floods and the, and the uh, big storm that went through uh, up, up, upper Midwest that wiped out large sections of the crop in this area. Uh, in livestock, you have weather disaster, we have risk of disease, public health risk associated with it that shuts the operations down in many cases. You also have market risks that are inherent to agricultural production with uh, variation, uncontrolled variation in production that leads to variable prices. You have disruptions in exports, again, as we saw in 2020. And you see upturns and downturns in the general economy that represent market risk. You have financial risk. There's high capital requirement for these large specialized operations and the equipments and buildings can't be simply used in something else, much like the big processing plants. You have a high debt financing because of the capital requirements, which leaves farmers vulnerable to downturns in markets or other risk. Up to now, the thing that's kept the industrial agriculture system going are farm policies. Uh, basically, the taxpayers have been asked to absorb the risk in this current agri-food system. On the farm level, we see it through subsidized crop and more recently subsidized revenue insurance where the taxpayer ends up about paying about 60% of the cost. We've seen it historically through price supports that protects farmers from price variability in the farm credit system that guarantees loans and helps farmers gain the capital and stay in business. But the COVID revealed risk, but it also revealed farm opportunities as well. And the risk in the midst of the pandemic, as we talked before, when the industrial food system basically shut down and consumers sought out alternatives, as we've heard before and you heard this morning, they went to home gardens. There's been a big upsurge in home gardening that people can hardly keep up with the, the sale of the seeds and the plants last year. And it started off similar this year with increase in home gardening. People turned to local farmers to get the product. They turned to any sort of non-industrial method, particularly something that they could access locally. The non-industrial farming alternatives that could meet the demand for these has been going on for a long time. It goes back to the to the 1980s. These non-industrial systems is what I call real organic. There's a real organic movement now. The farmers that didn't buy into the industrialization of organics and and they're holding true to the fundamental principles that started with organic. There's ecological farming. There's holistic management, biodynamic farming, biodynamic agriculture, nature farming. Uh, humanely raised, grass-based, free-range, sustainably produced, resilient, and the big one now I'll talk more about later is regenerative farming. All of these are alternatives to the industrial system, and they've arisen because of increasing number of people recognize the fundamental flaws in the current food system. These non-industrial systems are very different in industrial farms and food systems we see today. They're diverse. They're not specialized, they're, they're individualistic. They fit the particular farm, particular location and they're site specific. They're not standardized, they're, they're interdependent. You have people that are making particular decisions for themselves. They're not under corporate contracts or corporate control. They're making their own decisions and taking the risk much, much of it by themselves. Another important characteristic is they're management intensive. As a result of that, they're smaller. They rely more on management and skilled labor. So you're using more management skilled labor per, per, per acre of land or per dollar invested. And you're relying less on capital, less on capital, not just in the form of money, but also technology, less on purchased inputs. And in general, these more management intensive farms can then produce more food value per acre of land or per dollar invested. And so when we talk about moving to a, a regenerative agriculture, we're talking about moving back toward smaller farming operations in order to meet the demands. 
the climate change opportunities were already there. We, that was really the, the major movement in the local food movement and also in the sustainable agriculture as that movement prior to the COVID pandemic. And it's still there. It's still underlying and it'll still be there after COVID is under control. Regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming is the name you hear most frequently when you talk about a response to the climate change on the part of farmers. As I look at it, this is regenerative farming is just the latest phase in the industrial agriculture movement. Industrial agriculture, you know, has gotten a lot of different names and people say it's become so abused and misused that it's not meaningful anymore. But I, but I contend that it's the umbrella kind of concept under which all of these others come in. It's the ability to meet the needs of the present, the food needs of the present, and to do it in such a way that you do not diminish opportunities for those of the future. And so what we're talking about is a sustainable food system. We're talking about a food system that can meet the basic food needs of everyone, everyone in the present. That's what we talk about by needs of the present, the basic nutritional food needs of everyone, and, and do it in such a way that those people of future generations will have an equal or even better opportunity to meet their basic needs as well. And that's what all of these other movements about. Uh, it had the name of sustainability in the 1980s. Whenever I first got involved in the movement in the 1980s, we talked about sustainable agriculture. Low input sustainable agriculture was the first USDA name because organic then was kind of the old word. And then when organic began to drive the sustainability movement during the 90s, then that was the driving force. And then on the industrialization of organic, then it turned to local for that ecological, social, economic integrity that's essential for long run sustainability. And, and now it's the climate change issue that's driving the big forces here. And regenerative farming is the name that's come out of that primarily to focus on soil health and carbon sequestration to address the greenhouse gas emissions that are going along with agriculture, but at the same time doing that in a way that it builds this health and natural productivity of the soil. When you see it in the US, we're talking about regenerative farming. We typically talk about particular farming practices. There are different categories that people come in, but say these are some reduced tillage, um, you know, conservation tillage, no tillage, cover crops, cover crops, or or even keep the ground covered all the times. What you're trying to do, reduce fertilizer and pesticide use. Again, cover crops shows up as a way of dealing with that. Crop rotations, use of animal manure rather than commercial fertilizers, increased biological diversities, multi-species rotations. Again, cover crops, and that's the reason you see a big focus on cover crops right now. It fits into these categories. Integration of well-managed livestock grazing system, keep the ground covered all the time with perennial crops and integrate that into a regenerative farming system. Move away from these large confinement animal feeding operations into production systems that are more inclined with the natural uh, tendencies of animals to be outside and to roam upon the ground. I think it's important to look at the regenerative agriculture system or movement as broader than you typically see it in the US, just focusing on soil health and carbon sequestration and these things. And we run the risk of it being defined too narrowly. If you look at the international era, there's Terra Generis, uh, Genesis International. If you look at their definition of farming systems, for example, they have some of the same things, increased biodiversity and enriched soils improve watersheds, includes and enhance ecosystem services. But they also have in here increased real yield, which we'll need to do on these farms in order to meet the food needs of people as well as resilience and uh, to climate instability. But the important one here is that within the international movement in particular, they talk about higher health and vitality for farms and ranching communities as an essential part of a regenerative agricultural system. And they're not talking about just specific practices here. These are general principles that would be applied differently and might require different practices within different ecosystems or different nations or things of this nature. But those principles would permeate all of the regenerative system. An important part of this is it's consistent with the fundamental principles of agroecology. I think there's really two important concepts, but I want to focus on here that's kind of driving the local food movement as we move ahead. One of those is agroecology. 
agroecology has been around really going back to the 1980s, 1990s in particular, but it, it's kind of the scientific basis or the science foundation for the sustainable regenerative farming or sustainable agriculture in general, but sustainable regenerative farming. And the first principle of, of ecology, agroecology is just combining ecology and agriculture together. And the first principle of, of ecology, everything is interconnected with everything else. Everything with, within the soil, but the soil with the plants and among the plants and the animals and the plants and the animals with the soil and connected with the farmers and the families and the communities. These are all part of the same system. They're all interconnected within local food systems. The food systems that evolve under the umbrella of agroecology that are regenerative, resilient, resourceful, productive systems, those food systems will be individualistic and site or community specific rather than large and standardized and industrial wherever you go. The future of food, in my opinion, is local food. That's what I'm talking about. We talked about the past, the present, the future. The relocalization alternatives, we, we've seen those over the decades, and we saw a resurgence in the interest during the COVID pandemic. We saw it in farmers markets, CSAs, online marketing, food hubs. We heard some talk about those this morning, institutional food, farm to school, um, you know, farm to, farm to school and farm to table, farm to local supermarket or farm to hospital, wherever. Your institutional market, electronic aggregation, where farmers, a wide number of farmers can go together and list online what they have available and customers can go on and get it. In many cases, they even get it delivered to their home or they can go pick it up. I think the greatest potential for the future of, of the food system is in online marketing. I think there's a, a fundamental shift in retailing, not just food retailing, but retailing all across the globe. And it's going more and more where it's going to be online. I'm not saying everything is going online, but there's certain things that will go online. There's a fundamental shift from shopping centers to online retailing that we see today not just in the food system, but we certainly saw an upsurge in that. It was already there in the food system, but there was a study at one point showed that online grocery sales doubled during the pandemic when the pandemic hit. And I suspect that a lot of those will hold on. And the important thing is about when we talk about online aggregation or electronic aggregation or uh, online distribution, things of this nature, there's a potential economic advantage for local online markets. I'm firmly convinced of this, that you can assemble and distribute foods much more efficiently when you do it at the local level than when you do it like large regional level or national level as, uh, as uh, Amazon's trying to do now with Whole Foods. And we've seen uh, HelloFresh and Blue Apron and others try to do with delivering meals and things of that nature. There's a natural advantage and there's no reason you can't do that locally. We have people in local communities that know how to set up these, these electronic uh, systems of online food hubs, if you will. And the important thing is, is that reconnects farmers with combustors because it's, it's at the local level. And even if you order it online, it's farmers that are at the farmer's markets or have CSAs or other things. You go visit those farms, you can connect with them personally. It's people that care about food that are connected and their customers and the farmers that both care about food. And it's between customers and farmers that care about the land and taking care of the land. And that's, that's what sustainability is about. It's about caring for each other and caring for the land and finding a way to make that work economically. I give you some examples here. There's people I'm sure that are listening that may even come up with better examples. They may be others, but I think that many of you here are, are probably familiar with the good natured family farms of Kansas City, Missouri in that area. I met Diane Incott back in the 90s, if not in the 80s, I know it was in the 90s. Well, is that the University of Missouri? She's one of my favorite people in terms of go-to person of how to do this sort of thing. Um, Diane and Gary Endicott have, this comes directly from their website of raised natural food and beef using sustainable practices that result in foods free of antibiotics, hormone, pesticides. Within two years of starting their farm, the Endicotts realized the need for aggregation of other small farming opportunities in good natured family farms with a membership of 150 small farms was born. Good Natured Family Farms now distributes and produces uh, products of its members through Ball's Food Store, which is the largest regional chain in Kansas City. 
uh, Diane and Gary Endicott tied up with a local food brand that wanted to be local as well. So they shared that same commitment, but they also market in other ways. And I'm reading this because I don't know how you're looking at it and the print's pretty small, but here's another example of the scale that you can do this and still remain local, Riverford Organic and Devon Evans, Suffolk Fest, Veggie Nerd, Guy Sing, what was over the last 30 years taking River Ford from a one man in a wheelbarrow to delivering homegrown organic vegetables to friends to a national bed box scheme, delivering around 50,000 to around 50,000 customers a week. He says that anything we can grow and make ourselves comes from a group of organic growers and producers working with them over the long term means that our food is completely traceable. We think that small scale organic family farms are the most sustainable way of producing food. All of our suppliers look after their soil, livestock, and wildlife by farming respectively and in tune with nature. They only sell food that we think is truly outstanding, made by people we know and trust. Again, the connection, even though it's large and it covers all of, of, of England, what they do is they match cu customers with farmers, small farmers in that particular area where the customers are and the farmers can connect with each other. And they do it on a scale of 50,000 boxes of food a week. Here's Grantham Family Farms, LaGrange, Indiana. 1990, 1998, Greg Gunther was selling live hogs for less than his grandfather did during the Great Depression. It was then he entered the meat industry, all the while still raising high quality pasture raised pigs like his family had for generations before him. Here at Gunford Farm, we specialize in quality meat that is favored among our best chefs in the Midwest. All of our animals are raised in pasture without antibiotics. We have an on-farm USDA inspected processing plant that we harvest, process, package in all of our animals before we deliver them to upscale restaurants and retailers. Now you, now you can order our meals and have them shipped directly to our door. We are honored to be your farmer. I've known Greg Gunther for back since the 1990s, and I've been on his farm a couple of times. And, and what, he had to make a dramatic shift during the COVID uh, crisis because he was marketing mainly to restaurants. And many of those restaurants were shut down, but he had the flexibility to shift to go to online sales. And they were able to shift over to a lot of local delivery and online sales. And, and they've gone back to where they can get into some restaurants now, but I think they'll maintain a more diversified operation going into the future. Here's another example of White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia. White Oak Pastures, sixth generation, 152-year-old family farm in Bluffton, Georgia. We take pride in farming practice that focuses on regenerative land management, humane animal ag ag husbandry, and revitalization of rural communities. Our White Oak Pasture is radically traditional family farming. Uh, every day we butcher meat from animals raised in regenerative manner using humane animal management practices. This is no easy task, but it's our passion. To operate our vertically integrated zero waste model, it takes 155 caring people working together to accomplish the common goal, taking care of the land and our livestock and the land's about 3,200 acres. This is a larger operation. I'm not suggesting this is a model, but I'm saying here, here, all of these farmers are committed to these core fundamental principles of sustainability, ecological, social, economic integrity. It's not just livestock and crops. It's also there for grain, shepherd's grain. Again, these are people that I come across back in the 1990s. I'm only talking about people that I know something about. You can name a lot of others that I've read about that would be equally good examples. It says, we mix timeless values and tradition, modern day commitment to preserving our planet for generations to come. Sustaining our family tradition is intimately connected to sustaining the earth that enables our livelihood. Co-founders Fred Fleming and Carl Coopers was started Shepherd Grain in 2003 to promote no-till direct seeded farming so that they could renew and preserve the lands for generations to come, theirs and yours. Each grower is certified by the Food Alliance for Sustainability. They knew that better soil makes for richer grain, which produces flour and bakes better and tastes better. As Fred says, when you bake with Shepherd's Grain, you become a food activist and a disciple to save the family farm. This isn't just about making money. It isn't just about ecological integrity or taking good in the soil. It, it isn't just about community. It's about all of those things. It's about ecological, social, economic integrity. That's the, that's the future of the food system. Our food system today, I can't tell you when it's going to change or how it's going to change, but it will in fact change because it's not sustainable. It, you simply can't doing, keep doing what we've been doing 
indefinitely. I don't know how long we as taxpayers will continue to prop it up, but when eventually, when enough people in the public wake up to the fact that the, the fundamental flaws in our food system today and the possibility of the potential for the future, then we'll see a very different future. Trends never continue indefinitely. They eventually go too far. Industrial agriculture has gone too far. It's violating fundamental principles of ecological, social, even economic principles that eventually will lead to its demise and reversible. Trends never return to the same world they left, but they return to those basic principles, those timeless principles of nature and society. And those principles never change. We, we can ignore them in the short run, we can violate them, but we will always reap the consequences of our violation when we do so. The industrialization of agriculture has gone too far. It's violated ecological, social, economic principles, principles of relationships, our relationships with each other and our relationships with the earth. The agri-food system of the future will be fundamentally different from those of today. They will return to the timeless principles. Bioregional networks of local community food based food systems. I believe that is the food system of the future. I can't tell you how long it will take to get there. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but there are thousands of people all across this country, protect hundreds of thousands. And you heard from some of them today that are trying to find the way and create this food system of the future. Change creates challenges, but it also creates opportunities for a new and better food system of the future. Okay. All right, are we back now? Yep, you're back. Okay. Um, let's open it up for questions. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Hi, Doctor. Uh, thanks, Doctor Eckert. Glad to be in this uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, it was so illuminating. And my question is about the, you talk about the regenerative agriculture. Right now, what we have in article and the text is mostly focused on the uh, farming farm level, or maybe just in the agroecosystem level, watershed level. Do you think, can we have another principle and uh, we can maybe develop the regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming to other part of um, supply chain? Because we saw in the COVID uh, pandemic, right. the problem for uh, food supply chain, it was not in the farm system. It was mostly, it was in the other part of the supply chain, right? Right. If we wanted to uh, kind of uh, reorganize supply chain, how we can use the regenerative agriculture principle for this this process? Right. Well, I I think the uh, you know when you talk about the crisis last year being in the supply chain, and I agree with you that that's that's where it started, but the problem was with the system. You, you had farms that were geared up to fit that particular system. In other words, these uh, livestock slaughter operations, they were slaughtering thousands or hundreds of thousands of animals a day in some of these plants, I guess tens of thousands in a particular plant, which meant that every day that number of animals had to come off the farm somewhere. And that's the reason they were being produced under contract and put under it. So the agricultural system that supplied that system was, was tied in with the problems in the distribution system. So it wasn't just in the distribution system, it was in the farming systems that had been designed to accommodate that. The farms that didn't depend on industrial scale processing, they were the ones that benefited at least from expansion and markets during that particular time because they had the flexibility to do something else. So the problem was in the big farms as well as in the large scale processing, one of the things I wanted to make. Now, the other point I think is an excellent point. We can't have a sustainable agriculture or sustainable processing or sustainable retailing unless we have that whole system that's functioning in a sustainable way or a resilient way or a regenerative way. One way or another, we have to find ways for consumers that want something different than the industrial food system to connect with farmers 
that want to produce in a way that's different than that industrial food system. And there has to be a supply chain or a food chain that, that connects those two together. Anywhere, and I understand why people do it in the short run, but if you're out here on a small sustainable farming operation with a diversified farming operation, that just doesn't fit, doesn't fit the industrial system of distribution, of processing and distribution. And if we're going to change to have more sustainable local systems, we're, we're going to have to have smaller scale processing facilities. We're going to have to have smaller scale distribution operations to accommodate the smaller farming operations. And those have to be redesigned as well. I think it can be done. Not that you would have, let's say a processing plant in every community, kind of like we did when I was growing up, but you could have a, a regional, bio-regional kind of processing facility that would serve farmers within a reasonable distance so that you could get the product to the processing plant to be processed and then get it to that individual farmer's customers. And so I think you can have modest scale processing facilities. The basic problem that I didn't really touch on very much at all is the policy issue. Right now, all of the policies and regulations about processing and distribution are organized as if that system is going to stay industrial. And it, it, those policies don't accommodate very easily you building modest scale processing facilities. You could talk to Greg Gunther, if I mentioned here, about the challenges of getting on-farm processing, which he's gone through. He says it can be done. He could handle product for probably half a dozen or a dozen other farmers through his operation, but that would require coordinating with all of those other farmers to get the product in. He really actually tried to do it on, on chickens at one time and all the farmers wanted to deliver all their chickens at the same time. Well, you can't run a processing plant that way. That's the problem that Diane Endicott with Good Natured Family Farms has talked about. And she dealt with, you know, trying to get all these beef producers coordinated. They all want to sell their beef at the same time too. So we have to change the whole system. Great. Hi, Connie. Thank, Thank you for joining. Um, good to see you. You're up next. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Caitlin. Good to see you. John, I am very curious. Uh, you talk about systems and policy change. I'm curious of what your take is on um, uh, farmers of colors uh, and giving back land to indigenous people and uh, creating systems that provide uh, farmers of color with land. Right. Well, I, I think it fits in with the basic principles that we're talking about here that I've talked about. Uh, one is diversity. Any healthy system has to be diverse, and that includes human systems as well as is natural agro ecosystem. So we, we need to have diversity. And the other, and I've just, uh, there should be a column I write for the Journal of Agriculture, Food and, and uh, Community Development that should be out even this week. I just went over the proofs for it. Uh, making the point that, that if you're gonna have a sustainable local food system, it has to be focused on social equity and justice, not just ecological integrity and not just economic viability, but you have to have social justice and equity built into that system. It means that you have to have access to local farmers that reflects the issue of social justice and opportunity for all. And it's, you know, it's not just for uh, black or Hispanic farmers, which I think are clearly have been discriminated against in the past, but there's a lot of young people that simply don't have the capital or haven't been given an opportunity to get access to land. We have to find ways to give people access to land. I, I think instead of just talking about outright land, or, well, one thing is, is if you're producing a high value product and it's very management intensive, you, you don't have to have a lot of land to make a living to begin with. If you focus on opportunities where you've got a high value product that you can put in, a lot of management in terms of integrating various uh, very complex crop and livestock systems to maximize the productivity of that land, then it doesn't take nearly as much land. But the other thing is, is I think we are moving into a time when we'll recognize that what we traditionally refer to as land ownership, individual land ownership, uh, won't necessarily be a necessity or can't be a necessity to, to farm. I think we, there's people that are exploring opportunities where communities could have commons where they would go together and they gain access to land, even purchase land or whatever, and they'd make that land available to farmers within the local community and their accessibility and opportunity would be one that reflect the issues of social justice and equal opportunities, regardless of race and gender or any other characteristic of the individuals that pursued that. And you would end up then with a, a diverse ethically 
uh, uh, racial diverse mix of farmers and as well as probably end up with a much more uh, racially and ethnically diverse uh, farming communities. I talk a lot on issues of people that are confronted with the risk of large scale confinement animal feeding operations moving in. <laughs> and I said, if there's any upside to all of that, it's probably making our rural communities more, more diverse in terms of more culturally diverse. So I think we can build that into the system. The article that I'm talking about is saying, if we wanna to work toward uh, social equity and justice in a meaningful way, then let's develop local food systems and ensure social equity and justice within the local food systems we develop. And as we show the benefits of social equity and justice within our food systems, it'll spread from the, to, from the food system to the larger community, and then from community to community and to society as a whole. So I appreciate the opportunity to respond to that and promote my column. This supposed should be out this week from the Journal of Agriculture, Food and Community Development. Thank you for that question, Connie. Um, next, we have Christina Janney. You mentioned farms using more skilled laborers versus a reliance on technology. Do you think finding workers to do that work is a problem? We already have unemployment less than 4% in Northwest Kansas. Well, I think we've got a lot of people out here, particularly some of the brightest uh, young people that I know that I come across that want to farm, but they don't want to just go out to a routine job, which is back to the routine labor we had when I was on a farm as a kid, like putting up hay or cutting corn by hand that went to the silo, this sort of thing. So I think we've, we've got an image that farm labor has to be this routine drudgery work. We, we've got a lot of small scale equipment now that takes much of the drudgery out of farm work. And I think if you give people opportunities to, to be part of the management of the farming operation and to, to use their mental capacity while they're learning to solve problems on the farm and to apply those problems on the farms that they're, that they're working on or on their own farms, I think you find a, a lot of Yet particularly young people today that are seeking for play, some place where they can exer exercise their mental capacity and they can grow intellectually and emotionally while they're doing actual physical work. We've got all kinds of young people that have uh, high paying jobs and they go out and join health clubs so they can get a little exercise. Well, a little exercise won't hurt you if it's not drudgery work, a little exercise is really good as long as it goes on and, and doing something that uses your imagination. You know, I've talked about thinking workers and, and working thinkers. It's, it's not just being workers, that's part of the industrial system, or it's not just being thinkers, that's the management of the industrial system. What we need is opportunities for people to think and work at the same time, and then those are rewarding jobs. And the other thing is, is out of the total workforce, if we're going to go to a smaller operations like we're talking about, let's say we have a uh, about a million commercial farms that people consider their principal occupation today. We're only looking for opportunities for maybe uh, two or three million more farmers, and that's not a very large percentage of the total workforce. So we're not talking about everybody wanting to farm. We're just talking about giving opportunities to those farmers, uh, people out here, particularly young people that want to farm. Great, thank you. Next up, we have a question from Elizabeth Berger with the Sunflower Foundation. Um, great information, Dr. Eichert. Thank you. I particularly appreciate your attention to the current eco-agro model. Data from the past 100 years shows that food prices have actually fallen relative to overall cost of living. It's a smaller percentage of our household budgets now than many years ago. Some data even show a decrease of 82%. Yet the higher price of locally produced food is often cited as a consumer reason for not buying it. Would love your thoughts on the consumer side of the food systems equation. Okay, on the, on the food system, the thing we say about making food cheaper uh, by industrializing agriculture, that was the primary motivation for it. And you can show, you could argue that that worked from the 70s up through the 90s. We reduced the average percentage of consumer income spent on food from about 19% down to about 9%. But actually, since the late 90s, early 2000s, we're spending about the same percentage on food now that we did then. Very, maybe as low as 8%, as high as 10%, it'd probably be around 9% this year. Over the last 20 years, food prices have gone up faster than has the overall inflation rate, which a lot of people don't realize. And that's because 
once the food system became under corporate control, once we got more and more of it under corporate contractual arrangements and they captured the supply of it, then the large processors and retailers were able to expand their profit margin. That also shows in the profitability of those firms so that any further advantages in terms of reducing the cost of agriculture production was not passed on to the consumer, but went in the pockets of the corporate taxpayers. And that's the thing that more and more people are waking up to and, and trying to change. Now on the issue of, of food security for low income people and being able to afford good food, the reason that organic food and others are so much higher today than they are in the primarily in the, the supermarkets like Whole Foods and and even in Walmart and, and Hy-Vee and other places where you go in and buy organic food. Most of that is in higher processing distribution cost and higher cost of retailing because they're dealing with a smaller volume and they consider organic to be kind of one of the, the niches which they consider a high margin niche. And so they're making more profit on that. Whole Foods was the fastest expanding food chain for decades because what they were doing they were making a huge profit by tapping into the organic market and having very large margins for the that went to their uh, uh, corporate uh, investors rather than being passed on to consumers. But the, the reality is that it will cost more to, to process and distribute organic foods because we don't have those systems in place. And so I think if you localize food systems, you've got an opportunity to reduce a good part of that so that you can make those food chains shorter and they don't have to go into the industrial system. And when you're talking about organic and farmers markets and CSAs, you're talking about something that's more competitive, but it's less convenient because it's not coming through kind of the industrial distribution system. And so, uh, but I think we can make that more efficient. But I wanna address very quickly the fundamental problem. We're never going to make good food accessible and affordable to low income people. And most people are hungry and food insecurity because of low income, because of poverty. We're, we're never going to achieve that by simply relying on markets. We're, we're, we've been burning up about 40% of the corn crop in this country and ethanol for our automobiles because we can afford to pay more. We that have money can afford to pay more for biofuels to burn through our automobiles than poor people can afford to pay for food. We've been exporting about 20% of the production to other countries because there are people in the arising affluent classes, not the poor people in other countries in China and India and various other places that can afford to pay more for food that claims the land that we could have been producing food for people in this country. As long as we rely on markets, we'll always have hunger. What I've suggested and what I'm working with some people in Denver, Colorado called Metro Curing on is the idea of using the concept of a public utility to provide food security. Food security, the right to food should be considered a basic public service. We recognize that because we have government food assistance programs. I'm arguing that we need to be able to administer those local those government food assistance funds at the local level where people know each other and care about each other and can make sure that everybody gets enough good food. So that's a long answer to a short question, but it's a very complicated, difficult question, but I think it has solutions. I have a friend that out in Richmond, California that works in the low income community in that area where they transformed an abandoned rail line into orchards and gardens and the people within the community did it themselves. And, and she says that that people are hungry in this country simply because we don't care enough to change the way we do things. I think if we did it locally and we could see the kids that are going hungry and we knew the people that were going hungry, we would care enough to change the way we do things. Thank you, John. And thank you for that question, Elizabeth. It looks like our last question is from Bill Coe. Bill, would you like to share? Thank you, Dr. Eckert. Uh, particularly, uh, just enjoyed the excellent uh, presentation from the uh, past to, to where we are today. Uh, one question, I'll be tremendously brief. Do you think agriculture technology, yeah, I mean, you made the statement about industrialization going too far. Do you think AI and agriculture technology uh, has gone farther, far enough? To, to, to redesign what, what the new food system could look like? I mean, what are your thoughts? 
I don't think it's a matter of going for enough. We're, we're fighting now or we're faced now with two conflicting visions for the future of agriculture. I've given you kind of one, the future of agriculture and the future of food. I've given you one. Mm -hmm. The other one is just continue doing what we're do doing, but just be smarter about it and develop more technology, more sophisticated technologies, not change the system, just make it work better. You know, and that's what the AI information is that, you know, the, the old competing vision for the future is that that farming areas out here basically become what I call agricultural sacrifice zones. So that's the future of rural America. The only thing out there are, are machines that are run by robots and guided by drones. And right. you've got somebody sitting safely in their office somewhere that are guiding that just like they're guiding drones across the Middle East and for warfare. And you've right. got these these little robots that are going around shooting individual bugs that as they climb around on the leaf and things like that. And that's the vision for the future. And there's a lot of money pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm. But everything about that vision of the future is in conflict with nature. It, it, it says we can ignore the basic fundamental laws of nature that healthy agroecosystems and healthy human systems are inherently diverse systems, mm -hmm. that they're interdependent, that there's mutually beneficial relationships that have to function within those, that, that people are connected inherently. We're a part of that system and we need to be connected to the land. And we, we need to interact with plants and animals, that we're another species and that we have a particular purpose to, to fulfill within that that's, that's not higher than or greater than that gives us the right to destroy everything that we can't consume or benefit economically from, but says that we have to learn to live in harmony with it. I think we could learn a lot as we talked this morning from the indigenous wisdom, basically agroecology is, is very much in tune with the indigenous wisdom that the, the native people on these lands, whether we're talking about here or Australia or Europe, the, the native people understood that right. they were a part of nature, that they had to function in harmony in nature. And they understood that nature could be tremendously bountiful and give them a whole and full life if they worked against it. Right. Now, we've gone through 50 years of working in conflict with nature. We still have hunger. We have more food insecure people in this country today than we had in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. We've got an epidemic of obesity diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, a whole range of cancers that are associated with the industrial food system. And we say, we want more of that. Right. Is that right. what we really right. want? I think no. that's a better future. I want to yeah. close. I want to close real quickly by Thank saying you. people say, well, well, what can we do? The job is so big. It's so their corporations have so much power. There's so much bureaucracy and everything else. I, I've come to the conclusion in my old age that we each have a purpose in life. It's not a particular thing that we're to achieve, but it's kind of a path that we're intended to walk, that we're a part of this larger whole and that we have a positive role to play within the overall uh, harmony with nature. We have a positive place within that. And if, and if we, we individually find our place, and our place isn't more or less important than anybody else, if we find our place, if we find our purpose, and if we live day to day doing to the best of our ability what we think that we're here to do, we, we will have made the greatest possible contribution that we could have made to the greater good and to a better future for food that we possibly could have made because we will have done what we were supposed to do rather right. than trying to do something else because we thought it was more important. Right. And we will have lived the best life that we possibly could have lived. And I have confidence that there's more and more people that are understanding this and that we're moving in that direction and that together we can create a better future for the food system with local foods. Yeah. Yeah. I did have a follow-up question, but, um, it would involve a longer discussion, but it's about food insecurity in communities of color, because like you said, you know, coming together and going back to earth and going back to that education of nature and, and, and growing food in, within those confines of that, I think communities of color are somebody have sometimes been excluded from this agricultural movement. 
I, I agree completely. And I think the uh, the focus that I've talked about were, and, and if you send me an email, I'll send you a bunch of information. If we go to, okay. if we would go to the community food utilities and we go to communities of color and, and the people develop their own food system, what a public right. utility would allow them to do, the people within their own community to insulate themselves from the forces of the market and to decide internally within the community where they get their food, how much they pay for it, who produces it, how it's produced, what foods they have, what foods they bring in, what foods they keep out. You can internalize all of those decisions within communities of color, and then you could help let them empower people with government authority using already money that's already been appropriated for food uh, assistance, use those funds in a way that really met the needs of people within those communities. I think that's the only way we're going to address the issue of food security, not just for people of color, but for all people. For all people, right. right. But we can do it. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. This was very great.